Good morning and welcome to our hearing on performance budgeting. We have an excellent panel of government witnesses who have thought long and hard about this subject, performance budgeting, and I thank them for their participation today. Given the daunting challenges that face us budgetarily, we need more than ever to put the taxpayers' dollars to the wisest possible use. Earlier this year, the committee heard from government witnesses about efforts to combat waste, fraud, and abuse in health care, retirement, and tax collection. Our budget this year made provision for additional funding to provide for what we call program integrity in these areas. And those program integrity funds are included in the appropriation bills that the House passed. Today, we turn our attention to another aspect of stewardship. Our question today is whether or not there are ways that we can improve the tools we use to measure government performance and effectiveness to see that we're getting the most bang for our buck. <coughs> performance budgeting is not a new concept. Efforts to this end have been undertaken by nearly every administration for the past 50 years. The most recent comprehensive initiative was the Government Performance Results Act of 1993, which is aimed at creating a framework to align performance objectives and program activities. While the goals of GPRA are similar to other efforts, it differs from its predecessors in one key respect. The basis for the GPRA review is statutory, explicitly linked to the budget process and congressional involvement is mandated. During the current administration, OMB has embarked on the development of its own system known as Program Assessment Rating Tool, or PART. While similar in some respects to the goals of GPRA, PART has been used mostly to assist in the executive branch budget formulation. There's a wide range of views about PART. Criticism has been raised about its effectiveness, its objectivity, and some of those perspectives will be explored today. In hearing from OMB, GAO, and CBO, we have an extraordinary range of expertise, but before turning to our witnesses, I want to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Ryan, for any opening statement he may care to make. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Chairman, and I thank you for having this hearing. This is a very well-timed hearing, and I look forward to our witnesses' testimony. Uh, clearly, constituents want Congress to ensure that they're running their government and spending their tax dollars as effectively and as efficiently as possible. But Congress has long struggled to define that goal, let alone even achieve it. Uh, there's simply no formula on how Congress's spending decisions are made policy preferences, parochial interests, both inside and outside of government, and even emotional ties all factor into the mix. And it is notoriously difficult to come to a consensus as to which programs we think are working well and which are not. It is therefore critical that Congress has an objective means for measuring agency performance. Today, we're here to discuss several of the tools Congress has been provided to help us toward that end. And in particular, the Government Performance and Results Act and the Administration's Program Assessment Rating Tool, or PART, are two good tools. Clearly, there is not always going to be a direct correspondence between how well an agency performs and the amount of funding it receives. That said, let's look at this year's PART assessment of the worst performing programs uh, that appears to show how there's a complete disconnect between program performance and House Pass funding levels. If you could pull up chart one, please. Uh, consider what has happened with our worst performing programs. OMB's recent part analysis reviewed over 1,000 programs, 3% of which received a rating of ineffective or the worst possible rating that they provide. The President's budget requested lower funding levels for these programs, but as this chart, chart shows, the House actually gave them considerably more than the President requested. Again, there's not always going to be a direct correspondence between performance and funding levels, but it does seem that Congress is failing to take advantage of the tools that we have available to guide funding decisions, at least partially, on actual agency performance. So I think today's review of these assessment tools and how Congress might better utilize them is a particularly useful and constructive use of this committee's time, and I thank the chairman for having this hearing. Mr. Ryan, we'll go with Fitz Johnson first, the deputy director of OMB, but before we do, we've got a couple of housekeeping uh, details. First of all, uh, we have a request for unanimous consent for two witnesses, the statements of uh, Mr. Barry Anderson, whom we all know, Head of Budgeting and Public Expenditures at OECD, and Paul Posner, Director of the Public Administration Program at George Mason. I want to thank, take this opportunity quickly to thank both of them for their contributions to the hearing. We'd ask them to submit testimony to gain a broader spectrum of views about this subject from some of those who have thought long and hard about it. 
their observations will be part of the record and will be food for thought as we deal with this matter. In addition, before we proceed to testimony, we welcome, before, I, 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 okay. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that all members be allowed to submit an opening statement for the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. Let me welcome our witnesses this morning and say that if you have prepared written statements, we'll uh, treat your written statements as made part of the record. You can summarize them as you please, but the floor is yours, and we'll proceed first with Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much for coming. We look forward to your testimony. Great. Chairman Spratt, Ranking Member Ryan, members of the committee, thank you for having me. Um, we all want the federal government to be effective. We want to spend money on programs that work. We want not to spend money or waste money on programs that don't work or can't be made to work. And we want to get what we pay for. You and we all want to be held accountable for this. We're here to do this work. In fact, I think we should all publicly declare that we want to be held accountable for this. To do this, to deliver on this, for every federal program, we must have clear outcome goals and we must know how we're performing relative to those goals. We can't manage programs unless we know what we're trying to manage to. Today, every federal program and er therefore every federal agency has better outcome goals and more information about its performance than ever before. It's very good information. It's not perfect nor will it ever be perfect. Performance information, by its very nature, will get smarter and smarter about as we learn more and more about programs and develop ways to, to capture relevant performance information. But this information is very, very good. It's objective. It's consistent with the information we have for like programs. It's appealable by those who disagree with it. And it's reviewed for accuracy and quality on a regular basis. And by the way, uh, Chairman Spratt, let me add that it's not separate and apart from GPRA. It's very consistent with GPRA. It is a more refined way of dealing with, in our opinion, we're dealing with program performance. It's more information with which to comment and report on how programs are performing, but it's not something totally different. Because we have this information, we can now, and only now, link managers' evaluations to the performance of their programs. We can more formally focus every manager and employee on the desired outcomes of the program they work on, which means we can more purposefully and intelligently pursue the goal of greater effectiveness. In fact, we're going to talk here about the use of this information in budgeting, budgeting process, but I believe that the most important, most valuable use of this quality goal and performance information is to help managers and employees cause programs to be more effective. We can, but in addition to helping programs be more effective, we can also use this information to make smarter budget appropriations decisions, which is the subject of this hearing. We can, for instance, invest more in programs known to be effective and less in those uh, who are known not to work. We can decide not to create and fund new programs that duplicate existing programs, especially if they are not known to work. We can decide to increase funding for a less effective program only if its managers have a plan to fix it. And we can look at our spending by key indicator or strategic goal or desired outcome across all agencies to more intelligently debate relative spending levels and how to invest effectively and efficiently, efficiently to accomplish our goal. All of this is not possible, no, or none of this is possible without good goals and good information about how we're performing relative to, to those goals. This is uh, not something that's nice to have. This is something we must have for you all to do your work and for us to do our work to drive behavior and performance in the executive branch. I look forward to working with you and answering any questions you have um, at the end of this hearing. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And now, General David Walker, the Comptroller General of the United States. Thank you, Chairman Spratt. Ranking Member Ryan, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss performance budgeting as a way to help the government meet the pressing challenges of the 21st century by prompting a much needed and long overdue review of federal activities and programs. The federal government is in a period of profound transition. It face, faces a range of challenges and opportunities that can enhance 
performance, ensure accountability, and better position the nation for the future. A number of overarching trends, including the nation's long-term fiscal imbalance, drive the need to reexamine what the Federal Government does, how the Federal Government does business, and who does the Federal Government's business. The term performance budgeting encompasses a range of approaches, activities, and processes, but they all have one idea in common, and that is more explicitly linking resources to results. And in all candor, the Federal Government does an extremely poor job of that. As it holds promise, this is a means for facilitating reexamination of the government. Through the President's management agenda and its related initiatives, the Office of Management and Budgets Program Assessment Rating Tool, the Administration has taken steps in the right direction by calling attention to successes and needed improvements in Federal management and performance. As we previously noted, PART itself has certain strengths and weaknesses. The, the weaknesses need to be addressed and the strengths need to be capitalized on. Whatever approach is taken in the future, however, in our view, it will be important not only to look at programs and activities that run through the spending side of the budget, but also to look at those policies that run through the tax side of the budget. Any reexamination or performance budgeting effort that fails to include tax expenditures in the review of federal activities and policies and whether or not they're intended their, their, whether or not they're achieving their intended goals will far sh fall short of its full potential and will far, fall short of our nation's needs. As I previously testified before this committee, known demographic trends and rising health care costs are major drivers to our nation's large and growing structural deficits. And I'm going to take you through three quick graphics, two of which are in your material. The first one is not. First graphic, please. This represents the long-run fiscal situation for the Federal Government based upon baseline extended or, in my view, a more realistic alternative simulation which assumes no reform of Social Security and Medicare, discretionary spending growing by the rate of the economy, and historical tax levels over the long term. Uh, reality may be somewhat in between, but either one is unacceptable. Next, please. The next one is on page 11 of my testimony. It shows you what's happened since 1982 in constant dollars with regard to mandatory spending, which is the green line which is growing out of control, represents 62 percent of the federal budget last year. That's on autopilot. The blue line, which is discretionary spending, which Congress has uh, responsibility for dealing with every year. And the red line, which represents the sum of tax expenditures or the revenue losses associated with them. And as you'll see, the tax expenditures in some years exceed discretionary spending, and yet they're not in the financial statements. They're not part of the budget process. They're not part of the appropriations process. They're off the radar screen, and it's important that they be on the radar screen because they cost money and they may or may not be working. Next, please. And it's important to keep in mind that these involve $800 plus billion in the aggregate. Health care alone is close to $200 billion for 2006. Now, these are based upon Treasury estimates after the end of 2006, and in this particular case, we unbundled the defined contribution plans from the defined benefit plan. So if you add those together, you'll see that the uh, pension uh, tax preferences would be number two to health care on that basis. Uh, but the bottom line is these numbers are just too big to be off the radar screen. Accordingly, reexamining the base of all major federal spending and tax programs, policies, and activities by reviewing their results and testing their continued relevance and relative priority for our changing society is important. And the sooner we start doing it, the better. A re reexamination is not a one-time activity. It must be a continuing proce process, and we should expect even the initial round to take several years. Uh, it's, we, we could accomplish more if uh, the, the intent of the Government Performance and Results Act, which was to develop a comprehensive government-wide performance plan, was fully implemented. We think more needs to be done in that regard, but in doing it, we need to move beyond programs by programs and agency by agency to looking more horizontally and to also considering tax preferences. I think it's also important to keep in mind that the United States is one of few major industrialized nations without a set of key national outcome-based indicators. What do I mean by that? Economic, safety, security, social, environmental, outcome-based indicators in order to be able to assess which programs and policies are working and which aren't working. How do we stand as a nation? How are we trending? 
and how do we compare to others? And when you look at some statistics published by the OECD, of which the United States is one of 30 member countries, on a portfolio of indicators, the United States ranks 16 out of 28 on outcome-based indicators. As a certified public accountant, I can tell you that's below average. We can and we must do better. And I think performance budgeting is a way that can help us see the way forward and make some very tough choices. Uh, in summary, performance budgeting is one means that can help us be able to put our nation on a more prudent and sustainable fiscal path, to separate the wheat from the chaff with regard to which programs and policies are working and which aren't, and to make sure that we target our resources and preferences uh, to accomplish the, the, the best greater good uh, in a way that does not undercut the economy. But I cannot stress enough that performance budgeting cannot be merely an executive branch action. The legislative branch has to be a key partner in this effort. And for performance budgeting to work, the information must be not only useful, it must be used. And if it's not, it's a waste of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Walker. And now the Director of the Congressional Budget Office, Peter Orsai. Thank you very much, Mr. Spratt, Mr. Rye, and other members of the committee. Both economic and common sense suggest that a program's budget should be linked to its effectiveness in achieving its objectives. The concept of performance-based budgeting, though, has been applied mostly to discretionary spending, which represent less than 40 percent of overall federal expenditures. So like Mr. Walker, my written testimony extends the concept of performance budgeting to two parts of the federal budget that have not been examined as closely from that perspective, health insurance and tax expenditures. In both cases, the amount of federal funds at stake is substantial and important questions exist about the cost effectiveness of those expenditures. First, with regard to health care, as I have said over and over again, rising health care costs represent the central fiscal challenge facing the nation. My written testimony includes the chart that I have always used before this committee, but just for a change of pace, I won't actually put it up. But uh, if health care costs continue to grow at the same rate over the next four decades as they did over the past four decades, Medicare and Medicaid would rise from under 5 percent of the economy today to 20 percent by 2050. Yet very little analysis is undertaken of whether that spending is generating corresponding gains in the health of enrollees, which presumably is the ultimate objective of the programs. Many treatments improve enrollees' health, and the benefits suggest that health spending on average improves health outcomes, but in many cases such spending is not cost effective, and in many cases it may not even improve health. One reason is that relatively little rigorous evidence is available about which treatments work best for which patients or whether the benefits of more expensive therapies warrant their additional costs. Although estimates vary, some experts believe that less than half of all medical care is based on or supported by firm evidence about its effectiveness. Much of the research that has been done about Medicare spending and its impact on health has focused on the traditional fee-for-service portion of the program that serves the vast majority of its enrollees. But the concepts behind performance budgeting could also be applied to the Medicare Advantage component of the program. The data currently collected, however, are not sufficient to do so. Medicaid spending has also received relatively less attention. Like with Medicare, Medicaid spending at the state level varies substantially, even among enrollees who have qualified for the program for the same reason. More research on the source of variation in the program's costs and its impact on enrollees' health is warranted. In sum, we are spending a substantial amount of money on health care. It is the central long-term fiscal challenge facing the nation and yet we are doing too little to examine what we're getting in return. Second area of the federal budget that is often not examined from a performance budgeting perspective involves tax expenditures. Mr. Walker already laid out some of the amounts involved and they're obviously very significant. In each of the major cases, the reduction in receipts gives the appearance of a reduced impact on the federal budget and on the economy. Indeed, most presentations of the budget omit, omit any mention of tax expenditures whatsoever. But tax preferences are effectively equivalent to collecting taxes at ordinary tax rates on the full potential tax base and then subsidizing the preferred behavior through outlays. Because selective tax reductions operate as expenditures for specific economic activities, their effectiveness can and should be evaluated in the same way as is done for spending programs. 
Given the size of many tax expenditures, it is striking that they are subjected to little analysis of their effectiveness in achieving their objectives. In many cases, the specific outcome of a tax expenditure that is desired is unclear and may even conflict with, other obje with objectives of other policies. In a number of instances where the policy goal is clearer and not in conflict with other policies, the tax incentives do not appear to yield their desired effect in a cost-effective manner. For example, significant empirical questions exist about whether tax preferences for certain kinds of savings vehicles, such as IRAs and 401ks, have significantly boosted private saving or merely subsidized saving that would have occurred in the absence of those incentives. In addition, many tax expenditures are structured in a relatively inefficient way. In particular, most tax expenditures are delivered in the form of a deduction or exclusion, which links the size of the tax expenditure, or the value thereof, to one's marginal tax bracket. However, unless one believes that there is a differential response by uh, income category or broader social benefits that vary by income category when people do respond, from an economic efficiency perspective, it does not make sense to vary the subsidy rate per dollar of activity in any, in any manner, either up the income distribution or down the dis income distribution. So from an economic efficiency perspective, unless you have evidence to the contrary that there's differential response rates, the most efficient approach to delivering a subsidy through the tax code is a uniform credit that does not vary with a household's income. My written testimony discusses that at, at more length. I would also note that perhaps the most prominent example of a tax expenditure that appears to be inefficient is the exclusion for employer-provided health insurance and my written testimony discusses that issue in more detail also. To sum up, the growth of healthcare spending is the central long-term fiscal challenge facing the nation, and existing tax expenditures entail a substantial reduction in the nation's tax base. In both cases, federal policy would be improved by applying principles of performance budgeting, evaluating whether the benefits derived warrant the resources provided. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ozog. Let me put the question to all three on our panel. Is there some better systematic way that you can gain congressional review? Is part of the problem here uh, overkill? For example, Director Johnson, if your information largely comes from PART and from GIPRA and it comes with the budget, $2.8 trillion budget, it gets buried in lots of budget detail. Do you think it would serve the interest of greater scrutiny if the information were prepared in some different form so it came to us and uh, w was more discernible, more easily, easier to find, and otherwise it's scattered throughout uh, your entire budget? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, we, every subcommittee is different. Um, and for instance, the, the subcommittee's budget and appropriations that deal with uh, the education department uh, welcome a lot of performance information. It's really the model for all the other agencies. And yet there are other subcommittees that uh, state in writing that they don't want to be confused by my words, uh, all this performance information. So it's, it's not a universal acceptance or rejection. It varies by committee, which causes us to think we have an education challenge. Uh, before us to explain to every subcommittee how this information can help them do a better job uh, budgeting or appropriating. And, um, and we, every year when we talk about how to put our budget together, we talk about how to present this, how to focus on desired outcomes. The goal is not to spend two point X million dollars, billion dollars, it's to accomplish A, B, C, D, and by the way, the cost to accomplish that is whatever it is, that that ought to be the mindset in our opinion and our budgets, in our opinion, ought to be laid out to encourage that kind of thinking. But some committees, some subcommittees welcome that approach, are comfortable with that approach and others are not. Are you familiar with the selected acquisition report in the Department of Defense? No, sir, I'm not. Uh, do, do you have any experience with other, I'm sure you have had, accounting variation reporting systems whereby you establish a baseline for cost, schedule, and performance and then measure against that over time? 
uh, well, that's, that's the kind of rigor and approach that I, that's what I spend all my time doing is trying to create that sort of mindset and approach throughout the federal government. Let me just suggest so you take a look at the SAR, Selected Acquisition Report, created in about 1970. And somebody had the phrase, I think with General Walker, if you want it to be useful, it's got to be used. It's a classic example of something that hasn't been intensively used, and therefore it's not become any more useful than it was hmm. very much so when it was first introduced. Let me make one comment on that. I have done, um, for the first four years I was in this job, every spring I went out and did focus groups with career managers and talked about goals and having performance information and outcome goals and so forth. And what they told me every year, no matter who I talked to, We've always had some description of what our goal is. And sometimes it's been quantifiable, sometimes it's been general, sometimes it's been outcome, sometimes it's been output. But we have never, ever been held accountable for achieving them. So that's this, is it useful versus is it used? Their comment to me is this information has never been used to drive performance. One of the recommendations was made a long time ago, in fact, I wrote an article in General Walker's quarterly about it, is that somehow or another for weapon systems in the Pentagon, and there are about 40, I think, of maybe 50 that are tracked with the uh, SAR, the principals here in, at DOD need to sit down early in the life of a program when it's about to take off and go into engineering development and establish the baselines that are pertinent to that particular system, things that you recognize the vulnerabilities and the need to be watched so that you don't have one template that applies to 40 different systems that are very right. different and diverse. It would seem to me that on major programs you could have the same sort of attitude that the, you'd sit down with the committee and you would agree, we're going to watch these right. things, we're going to give you a periodic report on this. If it's going to be cost growth, it could happen here, so we'll watch it early. We don't have any of that inter kind, of, kind of interactive uh, activity at all. There is information, not of the sorts you want, but what you've just described is a great goal to shoot at. Uh, there is information now, every program, the evaluation of every program, overall evaluation, and then the recent performance of that program relative to its goals for all thousand plus programs, $2.8 trillion, is very public on expectmore.gov, the website, uh, what you're talking about is regular reports on here's where we're running behind schedule, ahead of schedule, whatever, and here's what we're doing to get back on track. We, we call this performance budgeting, but uh, part of it is just reporting anomalies that require right. further investigation should be called right. to our attention, like uh, Dr. Orzag's pointing to the fact that a coronary bypass has a fourfold variation around the country. And there needs to be an explanation of that or the variation in Medicare expenditures per capita right. ranges from forty five hundred to uh eleven or twelve thousand dollars per person. Uh, that's maybe not really performance, but it's the sort of thing where the executive agencies say to the Congress you should use your oversight and investigative uh powers to look into something right. like that. Well, we would welcome developing that and uh, figuring out how to interact with Congress to provide exception reporting when we, or not as you said, anomalies, uh, to help you all better focus on how these programs yeah. are performing. General Walker. Mr. Chairman, in, in addition to what you're talking about, I'd like to raise it up a level that I think we need to focus on, and I know you're interested in it. The Federal Government spends $2.7 trillion a year. It issues thousands of pages of regulations a year. It foregoes revenues of 800 to 900 billion a year in tax preferences, and for the most part, it has no idea whether those programs, policies, and regulations are achieving the desired outcomes or not. And one of the things that has to happen, I believe, is the Congress, which has the constitutional responsibility for appropriations and which has this budget process, which this committee is responsible for, we need to get back to basics and we need to say, what type of outcomes are we trying to achieve as a nation when legislation is authorized, reauthorized, when the budget process has gone through, when the appropriators allocate funds, and when the oversight committees end up conducting their oversight operations? And that brings me back to the need for a set of key national outcome-based indicators, economic, safety, security, social, environmental. 
thirty eight percent of the budget last year as you know was discretionary sixty two percent was on autopilot that's got to be on the radar screen we've got to analyze that too furthermore of that none of that counts tax expenditures that's got to be on the radar screen too we haven't done the basics we haven't stepped back and said what are we trying to accomplish are we doing that and as a result what the federal budget is today in the, in the government it's an amalgamation of programs policies functions and activities from decades many of which may be outdated many of which may not be working and given our challenges for the twenty first century we really need to focus at that level as well as well as making sure that we have as you're saying we're using the stuff that's being done now and we have a cons consistent approach and hopefully a streamlined and more results oriented approach to the current processes that are here now. Dr. Orzag. Uh, I, I Again, I think uh, an aggregate uh, perspective is important, but if there were a single thing that you needed that policymakers could do to improve uh, from a performance basis what we're getting today and in the future, it would be examining what we are getting in, in, re in return for our health care expenditures including the variation that you noted both in Medicare and Medicaid and since so much of the growth in the future is going to become come from increased expenditures in that area if there were just one thing to do it would be to make sure that we were getting value out of those dollars and that would be a substantial improvement relative to where we are today. Thank you all very much. Uh, we've just had an ominous bell go off uh, on a motion to adjourn so that's not a good sign but I'm going to turn to Mr. Ryan let's make up for as much as we can before we have to okay. run over boat and come back. Mr. Uh, Ryan. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I'll try and be fairly quick because we have, what, 13 minutes left. Um, uh, let's, I, uh, let me say for the record, I bristle at the notion or the term tax expenditure. It kind of more or less assumes that this is the government's money unless we benevolently expend it back to people. So, you know, be that as it may, let's focus on the health one. And if we're going to spend our time talking about this nation's fiscal challenges, we probably should spend three-fourths of our time talking about health care. And so what I want to ask from you, and I know uh, Dr. Orzag and, and General Walker, you spent a lot of time on this. Um, what do you think we can do to address the root cause of health inflation, number one? Number two, um, does the health exclusion, that tax expenditure, contribute to the problem of health inflation? And is it really the primary reason what which created the third party payment system in the first place which I would argue is largely the biggest contributor toward health inflation and then I have a question about TRIA I'd like to ask you and if, if there's time I wanted to ask you um, um, Mr. Johnson Dr. Director Johnson about how does the PART program interact with our appropriations process do you come and talk to the appropriators and, 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 and bring them through these things work or these aren't working and is there a connection between how we appropriate and the analysis you're doing. So let me stick with that and then a, a quick TRIA question if I have time. Let, that's a lot. First, let uh. me say that with regard to the tax preference, I think it's part of the problem. The fact that we spend almost two, the, the fact that we forego revenues, and by the way, tax expenditure is the Treasury's term. That's a generally accepted I know, term, I know. not mine. The fact that we forego uh, almost $200 billion a year in tax preferences uh, in the health care area, I think is part of the problem because. It desensitizes people to the true cost of health care. They don't see it on their tax return. They don't see it on their W-2. Uh, it's, it's the fastest growing part of compensation expense. It's a huge competitiveness problem for American business as well as, as a fiscal problem for the federal government state government. So yes, I think it's part of the problem. Secondly, I think part of the answer is better targeting of tax preferences and better targeting of government subsidies in the area of Medicare, et cetera. It's one thing to be eligible for a program or a preference. It's another to uh, differentiate uh, based upon uh, your, your, your income uh, and, and your ability. Thirdly, we need national evidence-based practice standards in health care to reduce cost, to improve consistency, to enhance quality, and to dramatically reduce litigation risk. And the federal government ought to pave the way through the programs that it has direct responsibility for. You know, we have VA health care. We have health care that deals with, you know, uh, with civilian and military, you know, employees. We have an ability to pave the way and to lead by example by there, and that is critically important. And, Dr. Orzak, at the end of your answer, if you could comment on 
the con contributing factor to the tax expenditure in health care. We just passed a bill yesterday on TRIA, the Terrorism Risk Assurance, which I think you scored at $8.4 billion, but it left the floor with, quote, unquote, no score um, circ circumventing the PAYGO process. If you can comment on whether that's going to cost the Treasury money or not, I'd appreciate that as well. Okay. Uh, why don't I start with that? Um, insurance costs money because uh, it provides some value to the insured uh, households or businesses. Even in the event that the, the the thing that you're insuring against doesn't occur, so when you insure your house against a fire, there's some value that's being provided and some expected cost to the insurance company, even if your house doesn't burn down. And in the context of terrorism reinsurance, we all would hope and pray that uh, that probability of an attack is very low, but there is unfortunately some probability, which is why firms want this insurance, and that was the basis of our score. It was consistent with what we had done in the past. I have seen some reports that people were surprised by our score, but it was fully in line with uh, previous analysis that CBO has done. The amendment that was adopted reduced the score to zero by removing the certainty that is essential or integral to the provision of insurance because it will, the insurance will trigger on only if there's a future act of Congress. And under our scoring, we don't evaluate future legislative actions, so it was scored at zero as, uh, as amended. With regard to uh, the employer provided uh, tax uh, expenditure, tax uh, preference for health care, there is wide agreement among economists that that is a relatively inefficient approach to providing a subsidy through the tax code for health insurance. It leads to, it creates a bias for employer provided health care as opposed to individual. It creates a bias for gold plated um, uh, health care relative to uh, uh, less generous health care. Um, plans and creates a variety of other distortions. I think the challenge in uh, thinking about options to uh, reform or replace it is that employers are the central pooling mechanism that we have in the United States for health care. And so if you tinker or change the tax preference for employer provided health insurance, what replaces it so that we're not all in an individual market mm -hmm. which doesn't work well in the health sector? D Director Johnson. Steve. The, the part in the uh, appropriations process. How do we re how do we met better connect the two? There is currently a um, <coughs> I forget the exact correlation, but I think you all ran a correlation of uh, programs that are parted on a low score and whether they what happens to the um, their budget does it go down? And there is a positive correlation. There is attention being paid whether programs work or not. It's paid more attention is paid in some some committees than others, but there is a positive correlation. Uh, every year we send up in a, the administration's a, budget. <coughs> Pardon me. In the administration's right. budget. Well, it's not in the budget, but in what money that's actually appropriated. Mm -hmm. Not only in what it goes on in our budgeting, but it's not true that every ineffective or results not demonstrated program is recommended for a big reduction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we it's such a priority we need to work to make it fix and right. we need to fund it in the meantime. In some cases, we need more money to uh, to uh, provide allow them to measure the quality in our parks and so forth and so on. So. Nothing automatic happens because of the current performance of a program, uh, nor should it. Um, so there's information up there. We'll send up like a hundred. In where I think several years ago it was 50, and last year it was 140 or something programs that we recommend for zeroing out or significant reductions. Usually a third, 40 percent, 25 percent of those are because of the way they parted. There are other reasons for the for the majority of those programs why they're recommended for a big reduction. Uh, they're duplicative, they work, but they're duplicative, or it's not a priority, or we can't <coughs> afford it anymore, or whatever. So there's a variety of reasons. Performance is not the only reason, obviously, to drive your all's uh, performance, I mean, uh, budgeting thinking or appropriations thinking, but right now, performance is being looked at. That's just why, and it can be looked at more, and it can be looked at more consistently across all subcommittees, but most importantly, we can do a better job using this information to drive performance within the executive branch, within the as David uh, talks about within the discretionary programs and then in the future in the non-discretionary programs. Okay, thank you. I, I see we probably have time for somebody else to ask. So We're down to thank six you. minutes. Um, okay, good. If you'll bear with us, we'll run vote. We've got six minutes for the this vote and then the two five-minute votes following it, so we should be back in about 15 minutes, barring some annex on the floor. <laughs> the committee stands in recess. <laughs>